So I noticed that everyone's freaking out about how hard Med Search is going to be. And I know from experience, it was the hardest class I've ever taken. But if you studied throughout the summer, then this doesn't have to be you. Just remember, nursing school is not forever. You'll be done eventually, and you'll be glad of all the hard work that you did as a nursing student when you become a nurse. Or you'll forget it all the first day on the floor. Either way, try your best. All right, let's get started. So we know our stomach has a lining that protects it from the acid that's inside. This lining can be eroded away by something called Helobacter pylori, or H. pylori. It's a bacteria that essentially just weakens the lining of the stomach, which causes ulcers to form. And this is what is known as peptic ulcer disease. Another thing that can cause ulcers to form include NSAIDs. That stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like ibuprofen, naproxen. You have to make sure that the patients take these medications with food to prevent the erosion of the lining of the stomach. Other risk factors include smoking, drinking, stress, spicy food, caffeine, and chocolate. Now what the patient's going to experience is pain. There's two types of ulcers that you need to know. The first one is called a gastric ulcer. With this one, the pain occurs one hour after eating meals. The other one is a duodenal ulcer, and this occurs three hours after eating meals and at nighttime. With this type of ulcer, the patient's going to notice that eating actually makes it feel better versus gastric ulcers, where food actually makes it feel worse. The other thing you have to know is that with gastric ulcers, the patient can vomit blood. This is called hematosis. Now think about it. Why would they vomit blood? This is because gastric ulcers are closer to the upper part of the GI tract. Now what you'll see with duodenal ulcers is something called melana. Melana is a fancy way for saying dark poop. Now why would they have dark poop? Because it's bleeding inside. Blood turns dark after some time. So as it's going down the GI tract, it's turning darker. This is what causes the poop to get black. So there's a couple complications that can happen with peptic ulcer disease. The first one is GI bleed. The ulcer can erode so much that it starts to bleed. Now what you're going to see the patient do is vomit blood. Sometimes this is described as coffee ground emesis. The GI bleed can also cause melana or dark poop as we mentioned earlier. You want to make sure you do a fecal occult blood test. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. If the patient keeps bleeding inside and losing fluid, they can even go into hypovolemia, which just means the patient's low on fluid. The first sign of hypovolemic shock is going to be increase in pulse. Later on, you'll see a decrease in blood pressure. The next complication is called perforation. This happens when the ulcer keeps being eroded away, it starts to bleed, and then it keeps eroding away to the point where it perforates. All the contents in the GI tract will eventually end up in the peritoneal cavity. It's the peritoneal cavity is the sac that holds your guts. What will happen is this will cause peritonitis, which means inflammation of the peritoneal cavity. The patient will experience a rigid, board-like abdomen when you palpate it. Positive rebound tenderness means you press down and it hurts on the way up abdominal distension and pain, and a fever. Now this is a good time to remind you guys a bit of funds. Remember how to assess the abdomen? The first thing you do is actually inspect it, then you auscultate it, then you percuss, and the last thing you want to do is palpate it. Make sure you palpate the area that hurts last. Now the treatment for perforation and peritonitis is antibiotics and surgery. So we need to make sure we call the doctor when we see these symptoms. All right, so now we're going to talk about the diagnostics. The first one is called urea breath test. This is essentially to test for H. pylori. The patient will drink this thing that has urea, either a drink or a pill, and then they'll blow into a bag. They're trying to see if the H. pylori made more CO2. So that's what they're going to be checking. They're going to be checking the CO2 in the breath. So that's how they check for H. pylori. Now how they check for GI bleed is something called a fecal occult blood. The other name being a guaiac test. What you'll do is take a stool sample from two different areas and pour special solution on it. And if it turns blue, it means there's blood in the stool. If there is blood in the stool, they'll have to either do an endoscopy or a colonoscopy to see what's bleeding. So the treatment for peptic ulcer disease, the first thing you want to do is make the patient NPO. For any GI issue a patient ever has, the first thing you want to do is make them NPO. 
This is to let the bowels rest. The very next thing you want to do is make sure they're stable. So check for any hypovolemia. And how do you do that? You check vital signs. You want to look for an increase in pulse or decrease in blood pressure, which signifies the patient is in hypovolemia, has too little fluid. You should remember this from fundamentals where you learn that when the patient has less fluid in their blood, their heart will start beating faster in order to compensate for the fact that they're getting less oxygen all over the body. So whenever you suspect hypovolemia or bleeding, you always look for tachycardia. Later, the patient will experience hypotension, but the first sign will be tachycardia. All right, the next thing you want to do is check for hemoglobin and hematocrit H and H. The reason you're checking this is you're checking to see if the patient has any anemia from the GI bleed. You have to know that normal hemoglobin levels are 12 to 18, and hematocrit levels are the hemoglobin times 3. So if hemoglobin is 12, hematocrit is 36. You also want to teach the patient to avoid things that cause the ulcer to get worse, like stress, spicy food, NSAIDs, alcohol, caffeine, smoking, and chocolate. So basically being a nursing student. I'm just playing with you guys. But seriously, I know what you all eat. Alright, so now we're moving on to the medical intervention. So what medications can be given for a patient with peptic ulcer? And it's going to be a combination of meds. It's going to be multiple antibiotics, PPIs, and something called bismuth subsalicylate. Let's start with antibiotics. They're going to give multiple different antibiotics. This includes antibiotics like metronidazole, which you should teach the patient not to drink any alcohol, clarithromycin, amoxicillin, or levofloxacin, which has a small chance of causing tendon rupture or tendonitis. You want to teach the patient on antibiotics to make sure they complete the entire course of antibiotics, even if they feel better. If the patient stops them early, it can cause the bacteria to build resistance to the antibiotics. Now we're moving on to PPIs, or proton pump inhibitors. These are very potent drugs that stop acid production. This includes pantoprazole, ezomeprazole, and omeprazole. Look how they all end in prazole. The next class of drugs is called H2 antagonists. These also stop acid, but through a different mechanism. This includes famotidine, cimetidine, and ranitidine. The side effect for these is going to be confusion and headache. The next class of drugs that can be used are called antacids. These don't stop acid, but they neutralize the acid in the stomach. This includes calcium carbonate and bismuth subsalicylate. If you're wondering, what in the world are these antacids? This is calcium carbonate. And this is bismuth subsalicylate. Some of the side effects for these antacids include renal calculi, which is a fancy way of saying kidney stones, and constipation. The next antacid is sodium bicarbonate. And if you think you've never heard of it, it looks like this. And the side effect is going to be hypertension because of the sodium. The last thing you need to know about antacids is that you never combine antacids with other medications. This is because antacids interferes with the absorption of other medications. Make sure you space these one or two hours before taking any other medication. The next class of drugs to help with ulcers is called prostaglandins. This includes misoprostol. This is for NSAID ulcers. There's a big contraindication to this and it's pregnancy. If you remember from OB, misoprostol has another name. It's called Cytotec and it can be used as an abortion pill. The next class of drugs is called mucosal barrier agents. This includes sulcrophane. The purpose of this drug is to coat the stomach to protect it from the acid. You have to make sure you teach the patient to take this one hour before meals and drugs. The last thing that can be given is anticholinergics, and this can be used to enhance the effect of the other acid reducers. And blood transfusions can also be done if the patient's anemic from all the GI bleed. Alright, so now we're moving on to surgical interventions. Sometimes the patients can get this procedure called a Billroth II procedure. Now, Billroth II involves cutting a portion of the stomach and reattaching it to a part of the small intestine. This can be done for something called a refractory ulcer, which just means an ulcer that doesn't heal. It can also be done if they find cancer. One of the complications that comes from this procedure is something called dumping syndrome, which is essentially the bowels emptying out way too fast. Some of the symptoms the patient can experience include diarrhea, cramps, nausea, vomiting, sweaty, and dizzy, or how I like to say it. Too much, too soon, oh shit. So how you can help your patient is by telling them to avoid carbohydrates, telling them not to drink fluids with their meals, tell them to lie down after they eat, 
and tell them to have small frequent meals. Alright guys, that is everything you need for peptic ulcer disease.